Welcome to Architecture at the Auditorium, exploring with the experts. I'm Rich Regan, CEO of the Auditorium Theater. You're about to join an exclusive tour of Chicago's Auditorium Theater with four of our experts. Each expert will explore a different element of the theater's architecture, focusing on light, the iconic arches, stained glass, and ornament. The Auditorium Theater is a national historic landmark known around the world for its perfect acoustics, pioneering architecture, and stunning design. In 1889, this Adler and Sullivan masterpiece opened to immense critical acclaim from all around the world. Today, it continues as a living and breathing performing arts space where we host dance, theater, music, and speakers. This week, for our final episode, I have the pleasure of joining Matt McNicholas, Chicago architect, auditorium theater board member, and ornamentation expert to discuss the amazing use of ornament throughout the theater. Enjoy. Matt McNicholas, thank you for joining us today and welcome to the Auditorium Theater. Thanks, Rich. It's great to be here. Now, we've got you in a different seat today, Matt. Usually, you're in the seat on the right interviewing our virtual tour content professionals. A little strange for me, yeah. Now, you're in the hot seat today. How does that feel? <laughs> I'm a little shiny for it, yeah, a little, little sweaty. <laughs> well, we're going to have fun here. We're going to have fun here today. So, today, we're here to talk about ornament. And what I'm concerned about is do we have enough time to talk about all the ornament? Negative. We definitely do not have time. Enough time, especially in this building, to talk about all of it, but we'll try. There's, there's quite a bit to talk about, isn't there? There is. Yeah, absolutely. And in, where we're sitting right now, in the dress circle on the second floor in the fireplace ingle nook, we're surrounded by such incredible ornament. Yeah, I mean, we've got everything here from, you know, the mosaic tile work and the carved woodwork to the plaster work and the gilding and the, the stenciling. And I mean, it's just, it's, it's a phenomenal, a phenomenal example of, of beauty in architecture. So in, in this specific location, it's actually the Ingle Nook where we've done the most restoration in. And we've done that work as you were the chairperson for our facilities committee, so you know this in such incredible detail. Why don't you tell us a little bit about this space? Yeah, so um, I think as, as a lot of people know, the, the, the theater's gone, undergone a few restorations over the years, uh, you know, long and storied history of it. But um, uh, this most recent example here behind us uh, and above us really, um, in, in terms of the stencil work, is uh, re has been recreated from old photos. Um, you know, much of the dress circle at the moment doesn't have the stencil work that's on the ceiling that, the, and on, the, and on the, um, the piers that was originally there, but we've restored it in these areas uh, just to give everyone kind of a, a look into the past there um, and how uh, this whole area would have been uh, completely decorated uh, as opposed to just, um, you know, paint with, with some moldings and, and gilding. So these two fireplace angle nooks are really the showpieces for what the entire theater looked like right. back in 1889, aren't they? Absolutely, yeah. And so to think about, you know, people coming to the theater at that time, you know, obviously our dress was different. You know, people still wear coats and ties, but there was a lot more flamboyance in, you know, your, uh, your theater dress at the time, right? I think the building itself had to serve as a stage uh, for the, the theater patrons as well as what was going on on the actual stage. And in a way, it needed to sort of step up its game. Well, you can see that throughout um, in all of this incredible detail. That's such a great analogy you just drew because I, I'd never heard it described that way where the building was trying to keep up with the Joneses. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think um, there, obviously that time, um, 1889, you know, the uh, detail in architecture was prevalent, right? And uh, it wasn't about streamlined or stripped down um, um, places. It was, it was more about like, what can you do with detail and how can you create something new and interesting? Not copying the past, but, but really uh, speaking to um, the place, uh, the people, uh, the time. And Sullivan did that um, in an incredible way. You know, he developed a, a system of architectural ornament uh, 
following this building, you know, years later in his career. But, but this really, in, in my mind, serves as that sort of how, how, where does the rubber meet the road, right? How do, how do these ideas that, he, that have been working around in this very young man's mind at the time uh, really come to fruition in three-dimensional details and two-dimensional details? That's a, that's a great point to make, that, that you know, the, the construction and the design of this building, you know, there had to be a buildup to it in Sullivan's mind. How, how did he get to that point? Can you tell us how he got to that point? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are uh, Sullivan experts out there who will, uh, who will, who, who will break this uh, digest apart, but, um, and rightfully so. But, but in a nutshell, you know, Sullivan uh, came from the East Coast. Uh, he, you know, spent years kind of bouncing around in different programs. Um, you know, he did uh, some time at MIT. He was uh, abroad for a while. And, and then really just you know uh, made his way up through um, architecture firms in the traditional fashion at the time, which was as an apprentice. Mm -hmm. And so he studied under Furness in uh, Philadelphia, and you know you can see a lot of the roots of Frank Furness's work in Sullivan's early work. Um, there was a, there was a heavy Romanesque influence from H. H. Richardson, mm -hmm. uh, famous American architect. And that's, you can see that on the exterior of the building here, that influence. But then when you really get into the sort of foliated scroll work and the design of these details, you know, it was Sullivan's own um, interpretation of these principles of nature and the way to take like what nature does and how nature flourishes and translate that into ornament that isn't a um, direct representation of nature herself, but rather an illusion to, or an abstraction really, conventionalization of these principles of nature that that um, you know that we know and love, um, even on a subconscious level. And I think that's what, when I look at this ornament throughout the auditorium theater, that's my takeaway. As we look at the mosaics over our shoulders here, right. I think that they're very organic designs. That's right. that's my takeaway. They're almost like vines and leaves in an abstract way. Absolutely, yeah. And so over the years, there have been references to uh, Sullivan's uh, arts and crafts. You know. Um, He's, he's sort of this tweener figure uh, between the arts and crafts and the Art Nouveau. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as we've heard from Rolf Achilles on the stained glass, the building plays an incredible role, and Sullivan himself in this, as his fulcrum point between um, these, these two movements that were very near, near one another. But when you talk about like this sort of the scroll work, this vine work, the kind of lines moving through, you know, that was very intentional. It was to draw the eye across surfaces, and then some would be uh, created in three dimensions. So if you look at the frieze above the mosaic, um, that's the plaster work in three dimensions, but the, but the mosaic itself is two. Both of them operate in different ways, but they both kind of work their way in this sort of sinuous uh, foliated scroll um, motif. Uh, th through the walls. And I, and I mentioned foliated scroll because that's actually the sort of basis in this sort of very classical and traditional design that comes out of many cultures uh, where you would have this sort of ornamental band uh, inspired by nature and it would work its way through kind of scrolling and then flourishing and scrolling and flourishing. So you can see that in a lot of the details here as he was developing his system. As you're describing this, I feel like uh, what you're saying is that through the different mediums, they complement each other. Right, right. So, so there's, a, there's a German term, I'm sure I'm gonna butcher this, Rolf would do a much better job, but uh, it's Gesamtkunstwerk, which means the total work of art. And it is essentially where every element of the building performs together in a concert, which is really appropriate that this be a theater, right? That everyone on stage is doing their part and, and creating this beautiful display. Well, every element of the building here is doing the same thing, from the stenciling, the, the gilding, the, the ironwork, uh, the mosaics, the woodwork, the carving. The building is singing to us, isn't it? It really is, yeah, and performing all together, right? It's, it's remarkable. And I don't know if... Uh, Sullivan specifically was thinking like that, but there were a lot of principles of Richard Wagner, uh, the, the, uh, the great composer, uh, who influenced many designers around the time. So I have to think that there was a bit there in his thought process uh, that was like, how do I create a building that's frozen music, that is this composition of all of these elements that work together uh, harmoniously and beautifully.
I have a new appreciation for what we're looking at. And I've personally looked at all of this for many, many years. And the way you describe it just gives me a new appreciation. One of the anecdotes I love most about the theater is uh, Adler and Sullivan did it together, right? And Adler is this just incredible engineer, right? He, uh, I think, touted by many as the, the best acoustical engineer in the world at the time. Um, and, and, and in addition to the structural engineer, and Sullivan was kind of doing all of the the, um, the the beauty around that structure. So the marriage of, of the structure and the details together is what creates architecture as opposed to mere structure, right? Or mere decoration, right? So um, Sullivan really believed that all of the details needed to emerge out of the architecture and be a part of it, contribute to it. So that's why we'll see like these capitals that hold up the arches, right? Um, the, the areas that will actually give focus to the important points of the building. Um, and so on and so forth. Adler, as a structural engineer, um, really believed in that too, uh, which is refreshing to me <laughs> um, as, as um, the profession has become more uh, sort of uh, fractalized, as it were, um, specialized. But he really believed and understood that the modulation of the surface and the way it would catch light um, was very important to the performance of the building, uh, almost as important as the structure itself. So the dynamic created by the two individuals, Dank Mar Adler and Louis Sullivan, was really, you know, they say a symbiotic relationship, but almost, almost a marriage. Yeah. I mean, two puzzle pieces that end up fitting, into, f fitting together perfectly, right? I mean. Adler was was um, further much further along in his career. I don't know exactly what age he was when Sullivan kind of came on board, mm -hmm. but he quickly rose to partner the firm and they created the firm together, Adler and Sullivan. But Sullivan couldn't have been, you know, but in his uh, I think late twenties when he was first made a partner. And of course, this building came along not long after, so still very young um, in his career. Although it was a different time, right? When you think about like how much schooling we do now, mm -hmm. um, he was apprenticing when he was, you know, in his uh, late teens, I believe, which was essentially his schooling. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So Matt, you mentioned something a moment ago called fractalization. I believe that's what you said. And I think I understand what that means, that, that essentially there's a base and then there's growth out of the base and it all relates to each other. Right. Is that essentially what, what that word means? You know, I think nature herself uh, is, um, is, the, is the best way to, to understand it. Right, and so you describe this kind of growth pattern, which is exactly that, right? It's a repeating self-similarity. It's the idea that as you uh, progress through this, the, the form, um, everything relates back to uh, this sort of central idea, and it all kind of emerges in a, a harmonious way. So if you think about a tree, the trunk then breaks down into smaller branches. Those branches break down into smaller and smaller pieces before becoming like the stem through the center vein of the leaf, and the leaves look and, and perform like one another as mm -hmm. these smaller extensions of the tree itself, down to the seeds, et cetera. Is it fair to say, using the arches that repeat out from the proscenium of the stage, was that an example where there's uh, a smaller arch yeah. right at the stage, and then there's a larger arch, and, and ever-increasing arches until you get out into the house? Yeah, I think so. Um, that, certainly on the macro scale, right? The, 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 the larger scale, because obviously we're perceiving these arches uh, you know, immediately when you walk into the space, that hits you, right? The, the framing of the stage and these big arches that reduce as they get toward the stage itself or they expand as they come away from the stage. And so that's on the larger scale, but then, you know, S Sullivan would break down that, those big arches into smaller and smaller details so that as you got ever closer to those arches, the details just kept revealing themselves. So at one distance, you're seeing the arch itself large arch, you see the gold. If you step 50 feet closer, you're gonna see another detail aspect to the point where you get closer and closer and closer and now you're seeing the bead and reel that goes over the arches, you're seeing the cast plaster, you're seeing you know, the radiator grills and then you're noticing maybe that like some of them are uh, silver gilded and some of them are gold gilded and you know, so ever increasing levels of detail as you approach it. And that's the way that nature herself um, you know, greets us. Mm -hmm. which, um, if I can go on a tangent here, uh, is one of the things I've always loved about this building. Um, current uh, research shows that, uh, that exposure to fractals uh, will do great benefit to us. And so there's no way Sullivan could have known this research. They weren't doing this. They didn't have fMRIs when, in 1889, right? Um, or even during any other course of his career, et cetera. They didn't have any of the technology that reveals this information to us now. 
However, this building performs in the way that uh, that research shows us provides uh, human beings the greatest benefit in terms of um, settling our nervous system, uh, kind of lowering our stress rates, um, returning us to a, a homeostatic position. Um, it provides incredible benefits across the physiological, sociological, and, and psychological levels. And so this building here is this great grounding device. Uh, uh, for people without us really knowing it. it operates on a subconscious level. So we know we love the building when we walk in, but you're actually saying it's healthy for us to be here. You know, research supports that, that, uh, that uh, suggestion. I mean, I think you would need to test every building, but there's nothing in this space in the research that I'm aware of that would suggest anything otherwise, except that on a subconscious level, on a level that we can't even perceive, we're having great cascading benefits of, of um, hormonal releases through our system by being in this space. And then of course you add to it the kind of incredible stuff that we have going on on the stage, um, and it just, you know, uh, how can you get any better than this? You can't, and what I, what I like to tell people when I tell them I work at the auditorium theater, it's a great place to call the office. <laughs> and once in a while, I'll just come into the theater uh, when I have to write something or think something through or plan something, and I'll sit in here and focus on the ornament. Absolutely. And um, you know, I know I always feel better when I do that, and I can sort of crystallize my thoughts. But now you're telling me, right. I know actually why I'm doing that and why I, why it's working better. There's a great anecdote in um, architectural circle, circles, but also in medicinal circles of Jonas Salk. Um, he was working on the polio vaccine. You know, was was missing, was missing, was missing. He couldn't come up with the solution. He ended up taking a sabbatical to Assisi in Italy, and it was there when he had the revelatory aha moment. So, in you know, in my opinion, he ended up re revisiting this this older architecture that had these details, that had this sort of form, that had this sort of like relaxation on a subconscious level that allowed him to uh, come off of the intensity for the vaccine and and arrive at a solution that has saved millions of lives. Let me talk maybe for a second about how that works because I think there could be people watching and being like, yeah, come on, right? The reality is that we perceive our environment um, in milliseconds and we have to in order to survive. That's a survival technique, right? So everything that we get through our senses is first filtered uh, before it ar arrives at our consciousness through our um, amygdala, right? Through the oldest part of our brain, which is, is this a threat to me? or is it a benefit? And that has to happen you know, incredibly fast, way faster than we can perceive it on any conscious level um, because that's our survival mechanism, right? And so we're looking for novelty and pattern and uh, we're looking for threats and, and benefits. And so all of that gets filtered through and everything we see is also then immediately compared to what we've already seen so we can identify if it's a pattern, is it a threat to me, et cetera. And, and so when you have an architecture that represents nature, and the details give to us something that is very um, emblematic or representational in nature, well then you're, then you're automatically telling your system that is working whether or not you're knowing it, that you're in a safe place, that you're in the natural world, that you're, you know, uh, and so your systems then kind of calm down and, and, and get to a, a homeostatic level. And allow you to open up at that point, That's right. right? And digest more and take in more. Exactly, so you have to, you, you can stop worrying about what's going on around you and you, you start to feel settled. There's a quality to this building really that is calming um, and centering. So Matt, I've heard of an architectural concept called seed germ. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Remember the seed germ is a maxim from um, uh, Louis Sullivan's system of architectural ornament. And effectively it's this idea that the entire uh, manifestation of what you're trying to do will grow from this initial thought, this initial idea, or this initial place, mm -hmm. right? So you, can, you, could, you could extrapolate it into a building overall, but uh, Sullivan was really talking about the details of the building, right? And, and so when you remember the seed germ, you're rooted in a specific place, right? This kind of fertile soil, right? And then through color and vibrancy, you have a growth. Um, and then that eventually becomes fertile soil for the next idea. He also talked about energy lines that came off of these things that would allow for a branching and, and flourishing. Um, and, and that's very evident in the green and the red here on these mosaics and, and in the gold work uh, through the plaster work in the building, um, through the arches, et cetera. 
Sullivan was obsessed with the idea of creating an American architecture. Um, there, uh, his main rival, I'll call him, his sort of main um, uh, uh, commercial rival would have been Daniel Burnham. Or, or Burnham and Root. Burnham uh, was the mastermind of the 1893 uh, Columbian Exposition. Mm -hmm. And Sullivan got a building there. Sullivan's was the only polychromatic building in the entire white city, mm -hmm. the transportation the building. Transportation, right. Sullivan was uh, distraught at the idea that Burnham won the, uh, d the design lead because Burnham was all referential to classical, Greco-Roman classical architecture of the past. And Sullivan wanted to create an architecture of the now, an American architecture rooted here in this soil uh, that grows out of the ideas of the American experiment that would represent the, the ideals of democracy and of the people of the United States, instead of referencing Greeks and Romans and you know European architecture. It really kind of came through in his system of ornament because he used all of this framework and structure, this very rational structure, uh, and then would allow the ornament to uh, emerge as a part of the structure itself. So the exciting part about the auditorium theater for me is that as many times that I've been in this building, working in this building, in and out of this building more than 5,000 times maybe, each time I walk in, I experience something a little bit different. I see something a little bit different. Yeah. And it, that's just an incredible feeling to have about a building. Yeah. And it, it's hard to describe, isn't it? It really is, you know. Seeing photos of it and videos of it um, are great, but you know, the, 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 way, the way that all of the, the ornament and the color and the material and the light and the volume transforms through some kind of alchemy into this multimodal sensory experience is just like, you've got to get here. Like the only way to understand what this building is, like the hair standing up on my arms, you know, my eyes are about to water, right? Like you have to be in this space to experience what it is, right? There's no explanation that will do if you haven't been here. And there's no explanation um, that will suffice if, uh, if you have, right? Like you cannot explain it to another person. They have to visit it. And, uh, and, and therefore that's really the only answer is to come here, be in this space. And, you know, I think the only way you don't have reaction is if you don't have a pulse. Such a good point. So buy a ticket to a tour, buy a ticket to a show. Yeah. Do both, Just, but don't miss it. Yeah, I, I mean, I've seen a, a, a ton of shows here and each one is different. Um, you know, from David Byrne to uh, Robert Plant, you know, to Jack White. Um, and those are just the music ones, right? Um, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, the tours are great, the shows are even better. Uh, you just gotta be here in the space to understand it and, and feel it, truly feel it. Very true. Yeah. Thank you very much, Matt McNicholas. Well, thank you, Rich, really appreciate it. Well, I certainly enjoyed this episode. Each time I sit down with Matt McNicholas, I learn something new about the auditorium. From ornament, to stained glass, to the iconic arches, to the use of light. There is a depth of history behind each element of the auditorium's design. It's been a pleasure to present these episodes to you, and I hope to welcome each one of you to the Auditorium Theater in person very soon. Thank you to Matt McNicholas and each of our experts for sharing your knowledge of the auditorium. Special thanks to our virtual tour series sponsor, the Ephraimson Family Fund. Thank you for joining us, and please visit our website at auditoriumtheater.org for more information on in-person tours and upcoming shows. Thank you.